Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, it's Wednesday, April 12th. I'll be talking with Mark Newton of Farnstrat Global Strategies in New York. We'll talk about today's move, a bull market, a bear market, a bull market, a bear market. As the day goes on, we chop up and down a lot of expectations. Earnings starting at the end of this week, a lot to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com. Today, remotely yet again, from the Hood River region in Oregon on the Columbia River. Great to be with you here on a spring break week and appreciate you tuning in. It's been a fun challenge figuring out how to do the show remotely. I think we got it working pretty well. We have a really good guest today with Mark Newton. He's one of the best, just a consistent technical analyst that I've known for many years. Always brings some interesting charts to help sort of put all these movements into context. And I feel like that is what investors are looking for a lot these days is context, trying to make sense of things. Just today, the S&P in the, in the green and the red and the green and the red as the course of the day goes on. Sell-off going into the close pushes the S&P back below 4,100. We're going to look at measures of breadth, which overall in some ways are continuing to improve. Looking at the bullish percent indexes and other places, some isolated areas of the market actually doing just fine. Right, A chart like Lamb Weston looks pretty good, pretty consistently good, in fact. Having said that, though, the major averages continue to struggle. The FANG stocks moving lower for the most part today. That's what's really weighing on these uh, indexes. We're going to dig into all of those themes and more here, but let's start with our market recap. I sort of uh, highlighted the fact that during the course of this day, it was a bull market or a bear market, depending on at what point you brought it up. And, you know, I'm here with my family uh, outside of the office for the week and, you know, just randomly working and checking in and then doing a random other thing. And what's funny is during the course of the day, every time I checked in, I feel like the narrative changed a little bit in my head. And that is what defines this type of market, really a choppy sideways market. Um, I had a really good conversation um, uh, yesterday on the show, talking about uh, with Chris Shavaco of Shavaco Capital about just sort of this, you know, sort of interplay between bullish and bearish themes, how at the end of the day, it's a choppy sideways environment. So where do you look for opportunities? And, and what's interesting is on a day like today, the S&P netting out to a negative, right? Netting uh, in netting uh, total return for today down below 4,100 to 4,092. The NASDAQ composite moving uh, lower as well, about double the negative return there, uh, down about 0.9% for the NASDAQ composite. Mid caps and small caps all down as well. Very few things looking at equities in the, uh, in the green in terms of the high level averages. The VIX didn't change very much though, which is interesting. Still right about 19, which I would generally describe as low volatility. If I have to say low or high, whether or not it's above or below 20 is sort of my general back of the envelope. Are we in a lower or higher volatility uh, sort of period? It's interesting to me with how choppy and uncertain the markets have felt. I would naturally assume volatility is a little more elevated um, than it is, but the VIX still right about 19. Interest rates, a lot of movement today. We had the CPI number, obviously, this morning. And I, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm wondering what sort of conclusions can be drawn from that. I feel like we're still in that same place we were 24 hours ago, which is a big question mark on the sustained impact of inflation. I think as earnings really start in earnest uh, coming up this uh, Friday into next week, Maybe this is where we get companies talking a lot about the uh, long-term impact of inflation through the course of this year, that we might be able to uh, you know, erase a question mark and put some sort of uh, you know, uh, broader conclusion. But for now, I think it's still open-ended. And maybe until the Fed meeting in a couple of weeks, we'll still sort of uh, have a question mark around that. For the most part, though, interest rates coming down a, a bit. The 10-year yield currently around 342. The dollar index down about a half a percent. So both stocks and the dollar actually down today. Commodities, for the most part, in the green, notably gold and silver. And as we continue our market recap, I'll show you two of the top five ranked stocks in our stock chart scooter rankings, which is a basically a proprietary model based on trend analysis. Two of the top five are gold stocks. That has not happened very often. And I'll show you which ones they are and why they're ranking so highly. But it's tell, telling you the nature of where things are, are at, right? Gold names. When I'm scanning for stocks making new swing highs, 
finding a lot of gold and precious metals uh, represented there. Finally, uh, cryptocurrencies, all in the red, although let's keep in mind something like Bitcoin, still pretty high relative to its range for the last three to six months. Uh, just below 30,000, that happened through the course of the equity trading day, particularly in the afternoon. Bitcoin uh, rolled over a little bit. Ether still in the positive above 1900. Bitcoin down below 29,862 uh, or so. Let us continue on our market recap, just looking at a chart of the S&P 500 and how today's movement fits into the overall trend. You know, I've, I've mentioned to people, and I'll show you a, a chart of uh, in, in a second, a couple examples of this. But, you know, basically, when you can draw a rectangle around the price action on a chart, it, it's the definition of a market in equilibrium. And I would argue really starting in November, and you can make the argument it started last year in the middle of the year, maybe. But I would say certainly since November of this year, you can see the move from October into November, early December as sort of that initial rally off of the new low, right? We made a new low for the cycle in October. We then rallied pretty well off of there, stalled out at the 200-day moving average, absolutely. But it was certainly an initial, what felt like an impulse move off of the lows. The higher low in December, and then from there, it's really been range bound, right? We've had a couple attempts, including this current one, to get above 4,100 and stay there. That failed in February because we kind of got above there a little bit to 4,200, but quickly reverted back lower into that range. On the downside, we retested 3,800 in mid-March and again, bouncing off of that range. So at this point, it basically implies that buyers and sellers are generally in agreement. And you can see that in the last week and a half, two weeks, that we've really been uh, you know, laser focused on a particular range. The S&P is worth about 4,100 points is what the market is telling you over and over. So what this tells me is to look for the catalyst, right? Look for the charts, the movements, the uh, the information that's going to break the uh, the S and P out of this range. You know, things that come to mind as I'm scanning for stocks making new uh, swing highs. I was doing that for my premium members at Market Misbehavior earlier today. Two sectors had a concentration of the new swing highs over the last week: healthcare and industrials. Which industrials is an interesting one, actually. A lot of industrial names are popping up there, and random things: building materials. You know, business support services is a group in there. Uh, a heavy construction, there's some names breaking out in healthcare, and it was all over the place. Things like biotech were on that list, uh, medical supplies, medical equipment. There are a bunch of charts that are actually looking pretty decent. Now, would I feel better if that was more in a traditional offensive uh, sector than something like healthcare? Probably. But it's worth noting that there are still charts that are working and there are still charts that are struggling, right? Look in communication services, you'll find some charts that are going down, just like some of the ones that I mentioned uh, moving to the upside. So again, I think this is a time to be, uh, uh, to be diligent, to be focusing on the charts and really think about the risk reward in some of the charts that you're, uh, you're looking at. Having said that, let's finish off our market recap, just looking at some of the themes at play uh, today. When I'm looking at the sectors going up and down through the course of the day, one once again, we have the MEI sectors, materials, energy, industrials at the top of the list. All three of those finished in the green. Some of them narrowly in the green, but they did finish with a net positive for the day. The FANG sectors are at the bottom of the list, consumer discretionary, communication services, technology. These are the sectors that were struggling. As I'm looking down, one of my favorite lists of stocks to review are what I call the Menomina stocks. These are those eight FANG and FANG-like names, uh, you know, like Meta, Apple, but also some others like NVIDIA and Adobe that I think represents sort of that growth-oriented trade. Look at the down move in some of these names today. And if you're wondering why the market was choppy but net negative, the fact that NVIDIA is down 2.5%, that Netflix is down 2%, along with Amazon down that amount as well, these are uh, charts that are struggling. Again, Microsoft up about a quarter of a percent, but overall the average sort of growth-oriented name probably struggled a little bit today. And, and again, when those mega cap growth stocks are struggling, our major averages have a very small, if not minimal or infinitesimal opportunity to finish in the green when those big mega cap names are struggling. It would take so many stocks to counterbalance the cap that is represented on some of those uh, larger names here. So I mentioned the top uh, 10 stocks in our scooter rankings. Again, this is part of our uh, dashboard that I like to have up, looking at the large caps or ETFs or industries and just focusing on the top performing names. Now, this is using our proprietary methodology called the scooter rankings. Uh, it's essentially a play on momentum. It's looking at different time periods, skewing more long term than short term, but it's really looking for charts that are demonstrating strength. And two out of the top five, in fact, two out of the top three are gold stocks, AU, 
and GFI. And look, look at those briefly, and you'll see why these charts rank so highly. AU is making a new 52-week high. So while the market is struggling to sort of regain 4,100, get a foothold above that resistance level and hold it, you have charts like this that are actually breaking above resistance, right? Rel above the January high and rotating uh, even higher. GFI is a stock called uh, Goldfields. This is about a 13 billion market cap name. Same thing. This one actually is still testing resistance from 2022. But look at the move off of the lows in uh, in February. Reminds me of the chart of the dollar, right? Which is sort of strong, weak, strong, weak, depending on what month you're looking at it. Gold stocks are really coming into their own here in the last a couple of weeks. And a lot of the stocks that I'm looking at, again, certainly in the material sector, breaking to new swing highs are all in this same group in the uh, gold uh, sort of precious metals, uh, precious metal space. We'll talk with our uh, guests today about gold trade versus other things and see where these fit into an overall mosaic looking at the market environment today. Just to finish off, I wanted to talk about two measures of breadth that I think are worth uh, paying attention to. Now, again, market breadth, in my uh, opinion, the way to define breadth is participation, right? I'm looking at how and when and why stocks are not really why, but how and when stocks are participating in the overall trend, right? If the major averages are doing one thing, what about the stocks that comprise those indexes? What's interesting is as the S&P is so far failing to get above its February high, it's sort of up in that range again, but for now sort of stalling out right around those highs for the last couple of weeks. Look how the advanced decline lines are actually continuing to push a little bit higher, particularly the S&P's advanced decline line. It's actually close to making a new high for the year. Now, how does that actually happen? What you have to remember is our cap weighted benchmarks are weighted to those mega cap names, right? So Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, if they are struggling, that is really gonna hold the benchmarks down. These measures of breadth are equal weighted, right? It's just counting the number of stocks with a certain characteristic, which means you could have the market stalling out a little bit as defined by the indexes, but the advanced decline lines could continue higher. That might be something to watch here because stronger advanced decline lines just tells me that despite broader weakness in, in, the, in the indexes, that there are stocks that are getting it done. There are stocks that are working. And I would argue that one of the goals of the technical analysts and really of investors is to find those areas of the market that are demonstrating strength and leaning into those top performing areas. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Mark Newton from Fundstrat. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Mark Newton. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in the week on Friday's show. We love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We are on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're there and put a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to hear from you and answer one of your questions live on the air on Friday show. Upcoming schedule tomorrow on Thursday, April 13th, we have Miss Schneider of Market Gage, former agriculture trader, really knowledgeable about some of the building blocks of these markets uh, with a with a focus on technical analysis. We'll see what charts Mish is paying attention to. On Friday, as I mentioned, we have our final bar mailbag, so make sure you get your questions in as soon as you can. Next week on Tuesday, April 18th, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer will be joining us on the show. Also, as a quick teaser, Friday, April 28th, we will be broadcasting live from the 50th anniversary CMT Symposium in New York. It will be great to catch up with some of my CMT friends, former colleagues from over the years, but also we're excited to uh, bring the show to you live with two fantastic guests. Uh, I'm excited to tell you about once we can get it all locked in here in the next couple of weeks. I want to bring on today's guest, Mark Newton. Mark is Managing Director, Global Head of Technical Strategy at Fundstrat Global Advisors, coming to us from New York. Mark, great to have you back on the show. How are you? Thank you, Dave. I'm wonderful. Really well. Thank you. Hope you are as well. Thank you so much. It's good to talk with you. Um, a challenging market. I feel like I, I feel like that's a way we could describe this market many, many times. But certainly now, it's it's there are a lot of question marks for investors. You brought a couple charts first, starting in the commodity space, where we're seeing a lot of resilience and and a lot of uh, impressive uh, trends at the equity level. Talk to us about silver and what this chart means to you. Yeah, I think we've arrived at a juncture where it's really important to have a lot more diversification in your portfolio. I mean, the equity rally is, is really, uh, you know, we've had a very good bounce off last October's lows as well as March and arguably into some really interesting, you know, potential resistance right near 4,200 in the S&P. But, uh, you know, we've seen evidence of rates really starting to roll over sharply in, in recent weeks and real rates in particular. And that's really helped to drive the metals trade. And, you know, a lot of people think of gold being an inflation hedge. 
you know, I would argue as real rates really start to nosedive, that's really an excellent time to own the metals. And silver has stood out as being actually even more attractive to own than gold right now, which is sometimes the case when the metals start to turn higher. So uh, I like silver here on a short-term basis and really also on an intermediate-term basis. You can see, at least based on the daily chart you have pictured here, you know, we've recently shown a breakout to the highest levels of the year, getting back over prior peaks that were made back between you know December and February. I think that's important. Uh, we've also broken longer term trend lines. And if you look at a weekly basis and, you know, that's also interesting, you know, looking back where we peaked out and, you know, the middle part of 2021, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's interesting if you want to know how to forecast some metals, you know, keep keep close track on what's happening with interest rates. And, you know, rates really bottomed out in the middle part of uh, of 2021. And that's when, you know, we, we saw at least initially metals start to pull back. And then recently we've seen the opposite when rates have peaked last October, last fall, and started to turn down sharply. And we saw some really great outperformance in the metals. So, you know, near term, I do expect we're going to see higher prices in gold and silver in the weeks to come. Uh, we might have a temporary peak and, and pullback in the summertime, which is normally a time of consolidation. But then I think mm -hmm. it's really wise to consider buying all dips. And I think really on an intermediate term basis, meaning, you know, in the next eight to 12 months, I think the metals are still quite attractive uh, and the metal stocks as well. And you noted you know, a few of those top picks within your scooter rankings of, of gold uh, stocks that you saw today. Yeah, it's it's impressive. While some areas of the market have certainly been struggling and, and sort of in this consolidation phase, gold, silver names strike me as some of those that have really started to improve and, and, uh, and made some new swing highs. Now, we're getting into a group now uh, looking at the energy space. This is a sector a lot of people talked about, certainly last year, as they were you know, just dominating for part of it. Now it's been sort of a, a bit more of a question mark, right? right? Potentially rallying into resistance. What's the XOP look like to you? Well, what I would say is that we did have a, a pretty normal period of mean reversion starting last November, where mm -hmm. you know energy being the best sector of the year initially last year, uh, you know, crude peaked out in the spring, started down. Most of energy held in there until about November, and we saw a very sharp pullback between November and March. And now that appears to have reversed, and specifically, uh, almost directly coinciding with the recent uh, you know supply cut we heard from many members of OPEC Plus, and so that caused a big surge in crude. And crude as of today is going to close at really the highest levels of 2023. So XOP is my pick on a way that, that really should give some outperformance to the energy trade. It had lagged other areas of energy like services stocks or the integrated oils from last fall. And now that has really come back with a vengeance. So we arguably are at a uh, an area of intermediate term trend line resistance stemming back from last November. Uh, my thinking is we can push higher above that level. Uh, only because crude itself is doing phenomenally well right now. And, you know, when I look at CFTC data, people are still quite negative on crude, you know, at a time when, you know, I think demand is going to be, you know, picking up. And, and there's uh, that's ar obviously arguable, but I think that the China reopening is going to be helpful to that regard. And uh, just energy itself, we've actually broken out in energy versus the equated S&P. When I look at equated energy versus equated S&P, we've had nice clean breakouts. So XOP is my pick. I, we, you know, some might require a little bit more to officially get on board from a trend following perspective. But, you know, I, I do like energy. I believe crude began a new bull market three years ago at the March 2020 lows and it went negative. And I think that's going to be a, a continued theme. I think energy is really still going to be a place to be for 2023. You know, it strikes me as you're as you're talking, Mark. It's a, it's a it's a great chart, and I and I love the the description you you were going through. When you look at something like crude oil, it strikes me. I, I feel like it, you mentioned the the sentiment was still so negative. Yep. I feel like a lot of times people get so locked into a a narrative, a theme. You know, oil's going lower, and then despite the fact that oil's no longer going lower, you okay. just still have in your head. How do you disconnect from? that narrative that's sort of you know in your head to actually recognize when something's changing because as you as you said the charts certainly evolved right so what do, what do you do what what are your tricks to try to disconnect from a narrative that is no longer accurate and and just recognize changes well i think that you know you and i and probably a lot of your viewers dave have an advantage in that we utilize technical analysis so we we can see these trends change right before our eyes in ways that maybe some that or looking at fundamental narratives, uh, you know, might be not so quick to pick up on. So, you know, when you look at downtrends in crude, like you see here, you know, and now just the right-hand side of the chart, you look at price today, we're up near 
you know, 83 and a quarter. So that's really the highest levels we've seen since last November. So that's a very impressive move out of a multi-day consolidation. Uh, energy, yet again, one of the few areas that's positive today. You know, we have seen a little bit of rotation in recent recent days or a little bit of an outflow from large cap technology and into energy, into healthcare. So for those looking for a good risk reward, you know, I, I do like energy. But to answer your question, I, I look at the price of crude itself. You know, I would look at longer term trends. I want to look at relationships between the sector and the broader index. Mm. And I want to look at seasonality. And we're entering really the best three months of the year back to back for for energy. Normally, April, May, June are very, very good. Uh, and finally, I look at sentiment. And, and right now, the percentage of people shorting crude, you know, the number of actual net negative shorts is at new four year highs as of about two weeks ago. Mm. So those things combine to make crude, you know, a decent risk reward for me at these levels. And I, I particularly like it, uh, you know, in, in the months to come. I love that. Thanks for bringing up the the uh, seasonality as well. I I always think of that as sort of the backdrop to what we're seeing. And you're right, we're sort of entering into that seasonally strongest part of the year for uh, for some of that space. I want to get to your your final chart, looking at biotechs. I mentioned in the recap earlier today when I'm scanning for stocks making new highs, I was surprised by how much healthcare was represented on that list today. What about biotechs is interesting or or not as interesting right now based on the charts? Yeah, arguably, you know, you still have to be a little bit selective in the biotech trade. You know, the large cap biotechs, you see a lot more stocks hitting new highs and small caps. But, uh, you know, I, I do think the group is starting to turn the corner. Uh, I look at the trend line just down from February. And to me, that has officially been exceeded. Um, you know, my thinking is that we should be starting a seasonal period of strength here also mm. in, in biotech and really healthcare, a group that uh, really has not worked in recent months, but but should be starting to kick into gear. So some of the pharma names look a little bit stronger, but biotech, uh, given that I think the stock market really has not shown any evidence of peaking out over the last you know couple months, we're still in, in trending higher from not only mid-March, but also last October. Um, you know, that bodes well to think that biotech, you know, might participate as the growth trade starts to reassert itself. And now we're potentially facing a pivot, you know, from the Fed, uh, if not, you know, in May, then, then very, very close. And you know, as that becomes more evident, I think you'll see an even stronger return to growth, which should benefit mm. uh, the biotech trade. Um, you know, and that's really one of the more promising areas I I look at in, in healthcare today. Really, really interesting, Charles. I'd love to ask you about a couple other groups, a couple other themes, if we could. One one thing that comes to mind is certainly um, uh, the financial sector. We're looking at the XLF here, but we could easily bring up KBE, the bank index, KRE, the, the regional bank ETF. We've got bank earnings coming up pretty pretty heavily here on Friday. Obviously, it's a group that has struggled but bounced here in the last couple of weeks. What is it that draws you to this area of the market or or keeps you away from it? I mean, is it and and how do you approach a group like this that's you know coming up on earnings? Is this a time to wait and see what happens, or do you anticipate them in some way? Those are great questions. It all depends on your risk tolerance and, and your time frame for investment. <laughs> and look, I think financials offer a very compelling short-term long idea. They have, you know, you look at charts like XLF and others, they have formed, you know, one month reverse head and shoulders patterns that were officially broken out as of yesterday. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. You could argue we need a little bit of follow through uh, in the next couple of days. But uh, that that to me is, is really interesting at a time when this space has struggled uh, so dramatically, and many people have gotten so bearish on it. And I think that, you know, it is ripe for a tactical bounce in a very seasonally bullish time in the market, that being April. Uh, but arguably, you know, on an intermediate term basis, they lose a little bit of appeal because they have su seen such dramatic uh, weakness in the last couple of months. And so it's not as appealing to me. And I'll say that that also lines up with the fact that I think rates are going to continue to drop. And if I if I see the 10 year going to 315 or even 3% on evidence of weakness in the economy, I, you know, I don't think financials is really going to be the go-to group. So how you play this really depends on your time frame. I don't mind being long short term in, in the financials, but I would really use gains as a chance to maybe position away from this sector, just given my thinking of, of where rates can go and um, you know, just the overall level of momentum weakness that we've seen recently. You know, one of the areas of the market that certainly has been leadership in, in parts of 2023 so far has been the technology space, the FANG stocks, right. a number of them being a little bit weaker here as we as we uh, go through this week. When you're looking at a name like this, particularly if you have a position in like an Apple or a Microsoft, 
what at what level or or what sort of movement would tell you that we're rotating away enough to sort of lighten up a position or, or how would you approach a chart like this in Apple and Microsoft? Again, strong year to date, but now all of a sudden trading up to resistance. Is this the type of thing you continue on with until proven otherwise? Or can you just talk through how you'd approach a name like that? So I'm very much a trend follower, Dave. I, I look at, at trend lines based on, you know, the, the lowest low, uh, undercutting the low to the, to the high. And so, you know, Apple right now is still, still trending up in my work. I, I don't see that having turned. I would also say the most recent swing high from February, as we all know, former resistance tends to become support on pullback. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that level is broken, I think it's right near, you know, 157 or so. Uh, yeah. That would certainly alert me to the possibility of greater weakness. Uh, for now, it has been a large cap decline in technology, but eco-weighted tech is still hanging in there. We haven't really seen the exodus out of many of the semi names and other parts of technology. So if, if technology on an eco-weighted basis versus the eco-weighted S&P is still trending higher, then I'm still a dip buyer. But for names like Apple, I still find them really interesting uh, from a risk reward on, on pullbacks to consider buying that. But as always, I'm, I'm open to change You know, if, if the market forces my hand. There's so many great uh, nuggets of investment wisdom there in 10 minutes, Mark. It was awesome to see you. Thanks so much for bringing some great charts and answering Thank questions. You, and uh, we'll see you again soon, all right? Thank you very much. Have a great day. I appreciate you having me. Take care. That's Mark Newton. Mark's uh, Managing Director and Global Head of Technical Strategy at Fundstrat Global Advisors. I tell you, if you ask me what I miss about working as an institutional investor, it was having access to guys like Mark and having them come through so we could talk about things like we just did on a longer, more regular basis is something I absolutely miss. Think about the way that Mark was just approaching each of those different sectors. And if you if you caught it, I asked him directly about how he recognizes changes, and you could see it on some of the individual charts. The way I would summarize it is when the evidence changes, when the chart changes, then you change, right? But until that happens, then the trend is in place. And I love that way of thinking about market analysis and technical analysis as a trend follower. And we, we often talk about, right, identifying the trends, following those trends, but then recognizing when the trends are changing. Some great ideas, some great uh, analysis there, as always, by uh, Mark Newton at Fundstrike Global Advisors. We have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one is the healthcare sector, XLV. I totally agree with uh, Mark's take on biotechs. Uh, we were talking before we went live about scanning for ideas, just a number of the different areas of the healthcare space. You see stocks making new swing highs, and it's not just the, the pharma, biotech. You're seeing it in medical supplies, medical equipment. What strikes me about the chart of the XLB, though, is I can draw a big rectangle over the last year and a half. What's interesting about healthcare is it's had this sort of uh, this cyclical pattern of outperformance, underperformance. You can see that in the price itself. You can see that in the relative strength as well. I get excited when a chart is improving and the relative strength is improving. It's really getting close. And I would say while the XLV may be not as, lot, uh, not as attractive, some individual areas and groups within healthcare absolutely showing uh, some renewed signs of strength. And I think it might be an area to focus on if you've not done so for quite some time. Chart number two, the KBE. I asked Mark at the end about the banks and uh, and we've got uh, earnings coming up this Friday. So as always, I would be wary with a group coming up with a lot of earnings because earnings present a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for things to, uh, you know, to break out, but also opportunity to break down. So focus on the charts. The chart of the KBE strikes me right now as what's called a pennant pattern, which is when you have a big move. Then you have a consolidation. Think of this as a coil pattern, right? We're sort of rotating around an equilibrium price around 3650. The range is narrowing. At some point here very soon, we break out to the upside or to the downside. I'd be very keen to see which way this breaks. And I think earnings this Friday are probably going to create that break we might be looking for. You're seeing a similar consolidation on our third chart of Tesla, a narrowing of the range, lower highs and higher lows. Which way does that chart break? We're pretty close to breaking the lower end of that range. And that might not mean the end of the world for our major indexes, but it might mean that Tesla is feeling a renewed sense of weakness and a lack of buyers. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. All of our previous interviews can be found for free at StockChartsTV.com. Thanks, Mark Newton from Funstrack Global, joining us from New York. For Stock Charts, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.